the ruling elite think you're stupid. As a matter of fact, they're counting on it. When they wanted to invade Iraq, the excuse was weapons of mass destruction. Turns out those weapons didn't exist. Oops. When they wanted to topple Libya, they told you Gaddafi was murdering civilians. Turns out these civilians were CIA-backed jihadists. Minor detail. They've wanted regime change in Syria for years, so they armed, trained, and funded an insurgency. Most of the weapons ended up in the hands of extremists who used them in rather unpleasant ways. This made for bad PR. Then the West claimed Assad used chemical weapons against his own people. They said they had proof before there was even time for an investigation. That proof, unfortunately, was classified. So of course, we can't see it. A lot of this stuff is classified at this point, so those things we're going to hold uh, pretty close to the vest. How convenient. They've tried the poison gas angle several times now. Each new episode, sloppier than the last. In 2013, when sarin gas was used on civilians, the West instantly declared Assad guilty. Airstrikes were on the table, and talk of regime change was in the air. The push to war fell apart when the official UN investigation into the matter found that the US-backed rebels were the ones responsible, not Assad. Five years later, as the last rebel stronghold fell and final victory was at hand, the West would have you believe that Assad lost his marbles. In spite of the fact that Syrian forces were easily wiping up the last militants using conventional weaponry and Russia still had their back, Assad apparently got an uncontrollable urge to use poison gas on civilians, a move guaranteed to trigger a military response. Why would Assad do something so stupid? Because he's a vicious animal who enjoys murdering his own people. Right. We can speak now to the Labour peer and former head of the Royal Navy, Lord West. He joins us from our Westminster studios. And thank you very much for your time this morning. Uh, you've been casting some doubt on what's been happening, the evidence, uh, according to uh, our own Defence Secretary, according to President Macron of France and others, about what happened in Douma, saying that the evidence doesn't really fit well for President Assad ordering a chemical attack. Just tell us more about your, your thoughts on that, first of all. Yes, uh, President Assad is uh, in the process of winning this civil war, um, and he was about to take over and occupy Douma, all that area. He'd had a, a long, long, hard slog, slowly capturing that whole area of the city, and there, just before he goes in and takes it all over, apparently he decides to have a chemical attack. It just doesn't ring true. It seems extraordinary because clearly he would know that there's likely to be a response from the, from the Allies. Um, what, what benefit is there for his military? Um, most of the uh, rebel fighters, um, this disparate group of Islamists uh, 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 had withdrawn. There were a few women and children left around. What, what benefit was there militarily in doing what he did? I find that extraordinary. Whereas we know that in the past some of the Islamic groups have used chemicals and of course there would be huge benefit in them um, labelling an attack as coming from Assad because they would guess quite rightly that there would be a response from the US as there was last time and possibly from the UK and France. But I find it very unbelievable that at this point where Bashar al-Assad has won, won in Syria, that he would jeopardize that victory by using chemical weapons and thus drawing the United States into the fray. The, the, the debate that seems to be missing from this is uh, and this was actually mentioned by the by the uh, the ambassador was what possible motive might have uh, triggered Syria to launch a chemical attack at this time in this place? Uh, you know, the Syrians are winning. Don't take my word for it. Take the American military's word for it. General Vergil, the head of uh, CENTCOM, you know, he said to Congress the other day, "America, uh, Assad has won this war, and we need to face that." So, and then, then you got last week the the statement by Trump or a tweet by Trump that, that America had finished with ISIL and we we're going to pull out soon, very soon. Uh, and then suddenly you. Get okay, I'm 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 very sorry. You've been uh, very patient waiting for us, but we do need to leave it there. I'm very sorry. And there's another problem with this story. Regardless of how it ended up playing, I think, uh, in the Beltway, what is true is Assad got rid of his chemical weapons. It was his decision to decide to bomb that helped to bring people together so we could cut the deal that got 100% of the declared 
chemical weapons out of Syria. The Syrian government destroyed the last of its chemical weapons stockpile in 2014, and they had absolutely nothing to gain by producing new weapons. The simple fact is, Syria didn't need these munitions to win the war. They had the full support of the Russian military. The rebels, on the other hand, did have chemical weapons and had every incentive to use them. The U.S. Department of State admitted that al nusra had these weapons in a travel advisory released in October of 2017. The Russian Foreign Ministry warned in February of 2018 that they had intelligence indicating that al nusra was in the process of planning another chemical provocation. This warning was, of course, ignored. Then there's also the fact that numerous reporters who visited the scene of the supposed attack and interviewed those who were present at the time found no evidence that any chemical attack actually took place. And here's the punchline. One of the supposed victims from the film the West is using as its evidence is in perfect health and is directly contradicting the official story. The West lied about Iraq. They lied about Libya. They are lying about Syria. And this is just the beginning. They'll keep using the same formula as long as you keep falling for it. So I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me and he said, Sir, you got to come in. You got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, Well, you're too busy. He said, No, no. He says, you, We've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, We're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to Al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later. And by that time, we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq, and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. When the powers that be want to start a war, they never declare their real motives or intentions. Doing so would undermine domestic support, weaken morale within the military, and invite an international backlash. Instead, they follow a tested and proven template designed to hijack human instinct. First, the public must be conditioned to view the target as a threat. This is accomplished by coordinating narratives via media and political puppets. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal. We do have people who submit pieces to other two American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks. This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into an executive session. Uh, at CBS, uh, we uh, had been contacted by the CIA. As a matter of fact, by the time I became the head of the whole news and public affairs operation in 1954, the ships had been established, and I was told about them and asked if I'd carry on with them. The enemy is framed as an arch-villain, their crimes built up, exaggerated, and woven with total fiction. Repetition is used to etch that image into the mind of the masses. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators, and left the children to die on the cold floor. I, myself, 
buried 40 newborn babies that had been taken from their incubators. Kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators. If a proper enemy does not exist, one can be created. Today's freedom fighters often serve as tomorrow's boogeyman. The U.S. backing and subsequent destruction of the Taliban in Afghanistan and Saddam Hussein in Iraq are prime examples. I mean, let's remember here, the people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. U.S. National Security Advisor Brzezinski flew to Pakistan to set about rallying resistance. He wanted to arm the Mujahideen without revealing America's role. On the Afghan border near the Khyber Pass, he urged the soldiers of God to redouble their efforts. We know of their deep belief in God, and we are confident that their struggle will succeed. That land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. To get their war, those in power need an excuse to attack. Military aggression must be promoted as an act of self-defense, retaliation, or humanitarian intervention. This can be accomplished by fabricating an attack and blaming it on an enemy, intentionally provoking the enemy into a response, or by justifying preemptive strikes as the only way to prevent an atrocity. Finally, public support is consolidated with the crusade mythology, a narrative that presents the aggressors as fighting for a higher ideal or greater good, with war defined as the means to that end. A war of aggression becomes spreading democracy, fighting terrorism, or bringing civilization to savages. These euphemisms define us versus them in exaggerated terms to dehumanize the target, sanitize the implied bloodshed, and activate the pack instinct in the form of patriotism. The United States has a new policy, a strategy that recognizes that the best way to defeat the ideology that uses terror as a weapon is to spread freedom and democracy. Come on, fire! In Iraq, a dictator is building and hiding weapons that could enable him to dominate the Middle East and intimidate the civilized world. Those weapons of mass destruction got to be somewhere. <laughs> this formula hijacks the most primal and dangerous aspects of human nature. Outgroup becomes a mortal enemy, a problem which must be dealt with imminently. Either you are with us, or you are with the terrorists. Reaction is shaped by defining the boundaries of debate. Should the president order a limited strike, or a full invasion? Was 100 bombs enough, or did this show a lack of resolve? One way or the other, the solution is always war. The way you eliminate the North Korean nuclear program is to eliminate North Korea. If there's going to be a war to stop him, it will be over there. If thousands die, they're going to die over there. They're not going to die here. The list goes on and on of, uh, of the threats that we, have, that we have made to the Iranians, and so far, no action. George Shultz, my favorite Secretary of State in all the world, once said, his Marine drill instructor told him, never point a gun at somebody unless you're well, ready to pull the trigger. We keep pointing the gun. We haven't pulled a single trigger yet, and it's about time that we did. The ruling elite think you're too stupid to put two and two together. They think you're too cowardly and apathetic to call them out. It's up to you to prove them wrong. If you want more people to hear this message, take a moment and share it with someone you know. This content is Creative Commons. You have permission to download this video, copy, and distribute it by any and all means. If you would like to support our work, visit our donate page at stormcloudsgathering.com.